All right. Hello. So today I am here with Coach Gina Robinson, and we are talking about coaching at different career stages. What is a good career stage to, to use coaching or to engage in coaching? So Gina, just to start out, I wanted to ask you to talk about like, what is coaching? Like what's the difference between coaching and just training or teaching? That's a, that's a great question, especially because coaching is kind of a new concept to a lot of people. And so one of the big differences between coaching and training or teaching or anything is that coaching is a relationship that you're developing. So it is two people, or if you're in a group, you know, it's a group of people, but you are as much a part of that relationship as the coach. And so you're not just like soaking in information. There may be some of that, right? And you can do that in all kinds of other ways. You can watch videos on YouTube. You can, you know, go watch the hundred best TED Talks or whatever. But this is much more about connecting new information to your life and finding ways to take your ideas and the things you want to do and actually make them happen. And so it is definitely not for people who just want information, right? Who just right. want to learn all the things. Um, it's much more about taking what you have and actually figuring out how to use it. I love that. And I also think that like, we're, we're so trained, tra speaking of training, we're so trained as academics, right? To like, take in like we take notes and we read things and we make the notes on the things and yes like we process information and we have original ideas but that kind of the kind of self-reflection and the um calling on the inner voices of the inner you know the self-trust um part mm -hmm. of coaching i think is something that is a new way to experience professional development for many academics like if you've never been coached before if you don't know what coaching is then it might feel strange to you, but it is definitely, I think, like so, so transformative. So, so let's dig into like the topic of the day, which is at what stage do you think um, career coaching or any kind of coaching, at what stage of the career is, uh, is a good stage to like start getting coaching? So do you have like just an answer to that question first? <laughs> well, actually, my my first answer is that um, I often in programs like when we're doing our Navigate program, I'll have people who are, you know, maybe a few years into their career and they'll say, I wish I had learned this sooner. And I like I can't tell you how many times people say that. And so um, so sometimes when people are thinking about doing coaching, I'm like, now is the time wherever you are now is the time, because later on you're going to say, I wish I'd known that sooner. And so that like, if, if anybody's thinking about waiting or like, oh gosh, there'll come a time that's, that's probably, you probably need it now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. Everyone is always kind of saying, okay, I wish I'd known that earlier, but this is a really good time to learn it. Yeah. I love that. The answer is now, if you're thinking about doing it, <laughs> yeah. the time is now. And that's the other thing I wanted to say, because I think sometimes, and, and I know that like literally I have been guilty of this myself. Um, I, I'm like, no, it's not that bad. I'm okay. I can mm -hmm. figure it out myself a little while longer. So how do you coach people uh, when they're thinking, when they're having kind of those thoughts? Or what would you just say to someone who's like considering coaching and then they're like, well, but actually I can just hang on a little longer. Mm. Oh my gosh. I, I have had that experience so many times in my life. And so part of it is like a really personal um, feeling that, that when you say I can hold on a little bit longer, it's already way too late. <laughs> you know, you, yes. you need someone when you start saying I can hang on a little bit longer, because if you think about it, ideally you don't want to be hanging on at any point. You know, as yes. soon as something feels wrong, you really want to be able to deal with it. And um, yeah, I've had a lot of situations where I felt like, oh, there's all this pressure mounting and I don't know what to do, but I'm fine. And the thing is, <laughs> if you wait until you're not fine, that's that's real trouble. And that's a lot yeah. that you 
you have to clean up. So, um, so if you're even thinking, I can hang on a little bit, remind yourself that you, you shouldn't even be in a point where you're hanging on. Yes. I mean, I literally have recently had this experience where I was talking to my coach. So I have like a, a life coach. I have a business coach I work with and I have a life coach I work with. And I was talking to my life coach and, and we were talking about burnout. And um, that's something, right, that we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, no, but I've been, literally said this, Gina. I was like, no, but I've been worse because this one time I was ready to like check myself into some, like the hospital. Like I was like, I need so much rest. The only way I can think about getting it is to like turn myself in, you know? Mm -hmm. And she's like, um, that's a little bit past burnout. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, that's like another level. And I was like, oh, so, so, so yeah, it doesn't like your um, desire to change things at, in your career or in your life doesn't have to get to the point where you like are ready to check yourself into an institution in order to make those changes. It doesn't have to get that far. Um, and, and even, you know, and we do have some clients like this as well. Like we have people who are like, yeah, like things are going good. I just, you know, want to tune up. Like I just want to yeah. like make it even a little bit better. And I love that because it's kind of saying like, just okay isn't good enough for me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to go, I really want to live my best life and live my best career. So I think that's like another, um, something to think about if you're, if you're like, oh, I can just hang on. Yeah, you're probably already past the point where you need some help. And that we, I've been there before. So like, I know, yeah. you know, I know that feeling. <laughs> and in that moment, like you, yeah, you can definitely stop. You can just take that pause and say, what do I need? And yeah. honestly, like at that point with burnout, it might not be coaching yet. You might need a month of rest and then coaching, yes. you know, yes. and that's probably what a good coach would say is just take, you know, take some rest. Um, but yeah, so waiting is, it, it's almost like drinking water. I've always heard this about drinking water. When you're thirsty, it's too late. You should drink water beforehand. So yeah. Um, yeah, drinking water and coaching, they go together. They go together. It's the same. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's dig into some career stages. I thought what we could do is kind of talk about, since you and I have coached so many academics at different career stages, um, mm -hmm. like what what kind, what are like maybe some common themes around different career stages? So let's just start with our early career folks. So the people who are either, you know, who, I mean, I like to talk about people who are in professorships, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with like, you just got your tenure track job or equivalent, depending on where you are in the world. And you've got that first, you're, you're in that first one to five years, you know, on the job. What are some kind of typical themes that we are coaching people around in that stage? Well, I think the first thing, the, the like most common thing is sort of this, um, this onslaught of opportunities that show up as soon as you become mm -hmm. a tenure track professor. And I've talked to people who, you know, they're the summer before the semester starts and they've already got, you know, a full inbox of, do you want to join this committee? Do you want to come and do this thing? Hey, there's this application for this thing. You don't even know about it, but here, just apply anyway. And I think that for that first year, it is about being able to breathe, being able to see what's going on. And then also, and this is like a big deal. This is like a set yourself up for a great career, developing like discernment that mm. to know. Um, and of course, you know, in our programs, one of the first things we do is we start with your, with your mission statement and, you know, you mm -hmm. want to know where you're moving towards and what, like be able to set your compass. And yeah. so- that can be really nice. I really, I really enjoy that experience of coaching people through that first year because mm -hmm. it's just so, it's almost traumatic, you know, how much stuff kind of comes at you and to have someone there, I kind of think of it as like, have someone there holding your hand, like yeah, you have everything that you need. You just need somebody behind you going, yes, you can do it. Yes, absolutely. And I think too, another part of that, that transition onto the tenure track or the full-time job excuse me, is, is like, is also about coming out from under the wing of your advisor, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so there's that, that discernment 
about what you want to do and also making yourself like whether you had a great advisor and so you kind of like have a happy feelings when you think about your advisor and like great collaborations or whether you have mediocre relationship with the advisor or you have a bad relationship with the advisor it doesn't matter in a sense your the work of those first few years is you know zoning in on what you want to do that's different from your advisor and how you're going to become your own academic out from under the wing whether it was like a very nurturing wing or whether it was not you know like mm-hmm. figuring out who you are establishing your scholarly identity is like such a big part of that discernment process and i think like yeah the, your the mission statement is really important there um and also just knowing that um i don't know i think like a lot of times especially when you've like just been on the market and so you're like really like trying to attract opportunity to you i think it like kind of overflows into that first year like there's so many opportunities and like yes it's great like opportunities are wonderful right mm-hmm. and at the same time if we say yes to all of them without discernment then we are setting ourselves up for a very like um like a diluted scholarly identity and mm-hmm. a lot of stress because you are like not controlling your calendar the way that you really need to to get your work done yeah and so you if if you can plan it before things get out of control yes. that's amazing right <laughs> but yes. um but then of course and i'm i think i'm skipping ahead now to yeah go ahead that that point where cuz i'm sure that there are people now listening thinking like oh god that would have been great but now i've got all of these problems that I've got to resolve, right? Yeah, yeah. And maybe you're two years in, you're three years in, you're starting to think, you really think about tenure. And yeah. that's also a really great time. That's actually when I feel yeah. like we really catch people, you yeah. know, because that's when people start realizing like how hard it is to keep doing this and how unsustainable it might be. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the moment when, those people who said, I'm going to hit the ground running as soon as I get my my first tenure track job, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But that does then end up a couple of years later being yeah. a, a little bit overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at that moment is where coaching around boundaries, you know, is really important. Coaching around how you prioritize things and that you are you have the agency to prioritize things for yourself. Um, and that that if you don't take that agency, if you don't step into that powerful place that you can exist in your career, if you don't do that, like you're gonna continue to get like bowled over by other people and pulled around by what other people want you to do because nobody is protecting your time mm-hmm. except you. Like nobody is out there fighting for your time. You have to do it. So I think that, Yeah. Once you're like looking, you're like, oh, I'm going to have to put up my tenure packet in two years or in a year or even in three years, like, and people start to panic, right? Because the timeline on academic publishing is so long and maybe they're looking around at their, um, their current situation going like, wait a minute, like, how am I going to do this for three more years and get the publications out that I need to get and go up and have a cohesive packet and all of that stuff. And And yeah, I think like, it's like, I don't want anybody to panic and then go to coaching, (laughs) but we do find (laughs) people that way. Like people, people are like Googling at that point, like where, how do I get some help here? So, so yeah, I think that's, um, that's a really important kind of moment that coaching can really help because it reminds you um, of your agency, right. And of your ability to really control what's happening. I mean, to the extent that you can like more control than you have right now. <laughs> mm-hmm, definitely. Yeah. And then, and then of course, now I'm like just going off and so excited. Yeah, do it. <laughs> um, the other, the other, you know, group of people we get, and this is um, outside of where they are in their career are people who really kind of want to either start a family, maybe they have a family and now they're mm-hmm. getting into academia or they want to be able to balance that, yeah. you know, the, the, the home life and maybe not 
having that second shift that we always always talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah. How to actually make the the work and the life separate things. Mm, uh, yeah. No matter what stage in your career you're at, that is that's something that you sort of constantly have to be working at. You have to sort of rebuild yeah. all of your infrastructure <laughs> over yes. and over again. And that's really, really helpful with a coach because um, yeah. again, it's, you know, you're holding someone's hand and you're, you're, you're going through it and someone is telling you that it's okay. Cause this is yeah. the other, I feel like there are lots of people who show up and they're like, well, my way of doing things isn't right. You know, yes. they're being told yes. that there's only one way to do things. And so mm-hmm. acknowledging that your way of doing things or the path that you took is acceptable. That's again, another really big part of it. And it is something that coaches can really help with. Yeah. And I mean, and really like kind of going back to the mission of scholars voice, right? The only way that academia is going to change is if people do things differently. Like, Mm -hmm. so if you're trying to do your career, the way you saw your advisor do it, or the way you fit, you imagine that other people have done it, um, then, then there's a certain amount of replication of the culture of academia that has that like that values overwork that glorifies busy and all of that stuff like you're going to replicate that of course like because that's the model that you have so so a coach helping you to see that you doing it your way like there isn't actually a right a quote unquote right way um Mm -hmm. and let's be real like the right way that a lot of people are trying to replicate is like a very white privileged, you know, like, like a very kind of certain way you have to have a certain body and a certain identity Mm -hmm. to have that way work for you. So anyway, we should do it differently. So and having a coach help you through that is important. Yeah, because I remember hearing in a group, someone was saying, well, this is, that's just always how they've done it. Yeah. And it was just, it was great to sort of recognize that no, but you are the future leaders here. And so it doesn't have to be that way in the future. Mm-hmm. But yep. the very first thing that we have to do is recognize that there is more than one way to do it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's move on to that. I just got tenure moment, a little bit like right after. This is one of, I, it might be my favorite moment to coach, right? Like that, like I did it. I got it. Oh crap. Now what am I going to do? So what kind of things come up when we coach mid-career folks? Well, I think that's, that's actually a really big part of it is that feeling of arriving somewhere. Um, we're, we're not really used to it. First of all, I mean, even like you get your PhD and you have to go right into your tenure track position, you know, and, and every milestone comes with another set of instructions. Mm. Um, but this one comes with like very little, you know, a yeah, nice phone yeah. call and then go off and do whatever it is that you do. <laughs> and I think that's a point when people really start to look around and say, I've, I've never really been in control of my career. So I don't even mm-hmm. know what to do. You know, I'm in right. the driver's seat, but I don't know how to drive yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and I think too, like the snowball of your career, like that snowball metaphor where it's like a big snowball rolling down a hill and you're picking up twigs and rocks and, uh, and, and stuff like, and, and it just gets bigger and bigger and you don't kind of realize it. And then you're until you're like, here I am, I have tenure. Now I'm supposed to be able to do whatever I want but I'm still like, I have all these things, like I'm still dragging all these things with me that I don't really want. And so I think I love, um, and also like most people who are mid tenure are, I mean, because it takes a while to get there, right? Like you're older and you're more mature. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's also like a little bit of that, like, you know, I'm 40 and I'm not going to take anybody's BS anymore, (laughs) you know, kind Mm -hmm. of part of it too, um, possibly. And, and it's a real, like, it's a real moment where, I don't know, I see a lot of our clients like really step into what they actually want to do and the career they actually want to have, because yeah, there's no playbook after a tenure for there, there might be some rumors. There might be like, Oh, if you're in a book field, you really have to have two books or if you're this, you have, you know, mm-hmm. but there's not, there's, 
even though there's not hard and fast rules for tenure in most places, there's really not hard and fast rules for full. And, mm-hmm. um, and even like in terms of timeline, because at least for tenure, there's usually a timeline, but for full, there's no timeline. Uh, they just, you know, of, it's okay when yeah. you're ready, but you'll know when you're ready. And right. I think the other thing um, that happens or can happen is sort of the sense of disillusionment mm-hmm. because we expect tenure to be a, like a fresh start or a big shift or a change. And when we realize that like the next day you wake up and you go to work and everything is the same, there yeah. is a, a real sense of disillusionment. Like, well, you know, what else is there? And right. again, it is with coaching, you know, just through like talking it out with another person that you can turn that disillusionment into something else, whether that's, yeah. you know, a different ambition or some kind of like empowerment that is going to help you make some changes um, rather than that disillusionment, then mixing with your burnout and <laughs> yeah. yeah. never want to go to the office again. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. We get a lot of, um, I think we get quite quite a few people at that stage who are like, I'm doing your program. And in the back of my head, one of the reasons I'm doing it is because I might actually want to exit academia. And I want to see if I can make it work for me before I take that drastic step. And, um, and we don't usually coach people out of academia. Like that's not not what we usually do. Um, And so it's, I think it's really exciting to be a coach of someone who is like, I have to make this work for me. And so I'm all in, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and I love, I actually really love working with people mid-career for that reason. Yeah. And people who are really thinking about leaving academia. So I've worked with um, people who maybe get to their third year review and they're not getting the kind of feedback that they want. And they're thinking, maybe I should, maybe I should just leave. And that is a great time. And, you know, you know, my background, I'm, I jumped yeah. ship many, many years ago, yeah. but I don't actually end up coaching a lot of people to leave. Um, yeah, me neither. I, you know, I can remember a couple of situations where really just acknowledging that, like, maybe I could leave. And if I did, it would be fine. Sometimes that sort of talks people back from the edge, right? From like, knowing that they have other options and feeling yeah. a little bit less less like hemmed in that yeah. can just open up a lot of like joy in people's careers um yes. that they just did not expect yeah they kind of stop being so married to the outcome and they're just like oh cuz i could do it or not and mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's actually a very freeing place to be like totally like and 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 really fun so I've been working, I've ended up working with, um, and I think, you know, in our Elevate program, we've ended up working with quite a few people who are doing, um, doing things inside of academia, like creating a research center, running an institute, um, that kind of, um, that kind of career move. And I've been having a really fun time actually coaching some one-on-one clients um, about that. And because it's like, I I get to bring my business and like organization building brain with my academic brain. And like, how do you build this organization like inside of your institution? Um, And that's been really fun. And so I would love to see more people, you know, like come on over and get coached around you know, when they're trying to, to build something. And I guess like actually building a lab, like in, in Elevate too, we get a lot of people who are like building labs and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, and I think one of the things that they, that, that kind of group of people struggle with the most is, is letting go of things, right? Like outsourcing, um, uh, delegating and all of that stuff. That's something that I think is much more common post tenure, but actually people who run labs and are in institutes pre tenure, which there are plenty of them are also like having to deal with that. Like, how do I not do everything myself? Um, and so much fear around letting go of, of tasks and, and, and outsourcing them to other people. Yeah. The, the delegating is, is really tough. I, um, delegating and <laughs> help, they're, you know, slightly different, yes. but I think that, 
Um, especially for our clients, I think this idea that they're going to increase somebody else's workload and make mm. someone else unhappy um, is is the main reason why people don't delegate when they can. You know, and it's yeah. the same thing with asking for help, right? I'm overwhelmed and I need a colleague to take over something and we don't want to do it because we don't want to burden other people. Yeah. But the thing is, we still have to take care of ourselves. And that is, yeah. it's just, it's really hard at just about any phase. But I've definitely noticed when people are in those leadership positions where they've got people underneath them, you know, there's there's a lot of energy that they spend trying to take care of other people. And yeah. so again, a coach is going to remind you to start taking care of yourself. Yeah. And one of the things too, that a coach can help you do is, and it's, it's amazing how difficult this is, is figuring out what you actually want to do, mm -hmm. like what you like to do and what you want to do and what you're uniquely good at. Um, it's amazing how many clients don't really know, like they've never been asked, mm -hmm. you know, like you've just always had to do everything. So you, you know, you just, and you do it. And, and for our clients, at least you do it with excellence. Like everything you do, you do with excellence. Of course you do. Um, and so discerning again, right? Like discerning, like, what is the, what is the thing that I'm uniquely good at? So I should stick with that rather than like be worried about like, you know, I don't like this thing. And so I don't want to give it to somebody else, but actually like understanding what you're good at and where you really need to invest your limited time and energy versus other things that other people could be doing, like figuring that out is, um, I think is really, really important and, uh, and, and helpful when you have a coach. Definitely. Yeah. Especially because as you, as you rise through your career, I'm going to think of it as sort of like an escalator. Yeah. Um, you're, you know, you're getting more and more responsibility and your understanding of who you are doesn't necessarily move at the same rate. Mm, Does that make sense? Yes, yes, like, yes. Um, and actually, I think it might have been um, a, a coach that you really love, Natalie Miller. Is it? Um, yeah. She she mentioned in one of her podcasts how if you're thinking like I'm almost there, I'm almost to that next level, you might actually be there, and that's just sort of your mindset lagging a little bit. Yes. And so yes. when people take on new leadership positions or try to build something new they don't often have someone there sort of helping them with that mindset. And that's, yeah. that's honestly like sometimes the hardest part because we know how to do all the rest of it, right? Yeah. And, and that's part of why we don't want to give anything up or delegate because we are good at all of those things. You know, yes. we're, we're good at the very highest level things, but we're also very good at typing. So we want to make sure we type everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're very good at proofreading. Yeah. I should not be proofreading because <laughs> right. there are other people who are good at that. Um, yes. And like you said, we're just, we're used to being good at everything. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things to ask people is sort of to choose something that they can be bad at, that they're yeah. just <laughs> okay with being bad at. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like I am terrible at, I don't know, taking out the trash. There are things that, you know what, if you're bad at it, I don't think anybody's ever really going to be unhappy with that. And right. it's hard for a lot of people to sort of, to, to really internalize that because we've grown up learning yes. that to be good at everything. So, yes. And yeah. Yeah. No. And that if you're bad at something, school teaches you that you should try to get better at it. And, mm -hmm. at, and I think it, it's related to that lagging mindset or that lagging understanding of like who you actually are and, and what you've actually accomplished. It's like, actually at your level as a professor, you should stop trying to get good at things you're bad at and figure out how you're going to delegate things that you're bad at, or even that you're mediocre at, or even that you're excellent at so that you can really work in your genius areas and you can really like do the things that are uniquely suited to you. Um, and stop, like, we hear that so much, like people, I need to get better at this, or I need to, it's like, actually, no, you, you need to be you. So how can you be more you, um, and solve your problems by being more you rather than by saying like, I'm lacking 
this. And so I need to get better, better at it. Like, yeah, Mm -hmm. you're, you're, no, you're, you're beyond that. (laughs) You have a level of expertise that needs to be like really, um, I don't know, like nurtured and cared for. And so you don't need to be wasting your time, like getting good at things that you're not good at. Yeah. I really like that. And it takes off so much pressure, right? Yeah. Um, because again, like at just about any stage, you're um, you're not only dealing with whatever expectations are coming externally, but also your own internal expectations. Yeah. And this is also something that I've realized working with so many people is that we hold ourselves to such high standards that um that you know it doesn't matter what what I have to do for tenure, I have these standards. And, right. you know, and of course that's, that's amazing because that's gotten most yes. of us to where we are. But yeah. again, it's one of those things that now you can kind of start to let go of just like yeah. worrying about what you're not good at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's, that's probably a good place to wrap up today. We covered so much. This was really a great conversation. Thank you, Gina. Yeah, it was. I love talking about coaching. So I know I do talk about coaching anytime. (laughs) Yay. So um, before we leave, I'll just say that if you're interested in our Navigate program, which now um, includes coaching, like that's something that we decided to pull into our signature program. I was like, why didn't we do this before? But um, we, you can always go to scholarsvoice.org slash navigate find the pink button and either sign up for the wait list or if we're enrolling, that pink button will say uh, apply now. So, um, and you can get coached with us, which is so much fun. Yeah. Awesome.